I decided to go on camera for this week's Gamer's Guide to Feminism for reasons that will become clear. This is the beginning of our pivot away from history and towards theory, and we're starting with a big theoretical point when it comes to gaming and feminism. Objectification. Most of the time when we talked about objectification, it's sexual objectification. But with gaming, we have to dig a little deeper. The intention of this video is to explore a concept, not to tell you what to think about a particular video game or video games in general. Any examples provided here are a look at a very specific part of a game, not a judgment of the entire game. So if your favorite game is referenced and you don't like what I say, don't freak out. It's not a condemnation of the game as a whole. Even if the game were any form of media objectifies a character, even when it's sexual objectification, that isn't always bad, as we'll see as we proceed. Let's start simple. Objectification is essentially dehumanizing a person to the point where they're seen as an object, like this image of a model in a beer ad who has been made to look like a beer bottle. The problem isn't that this ad features an attractive woman. The problem is that this attractive woman is being visually turned into a consumer product. This isn't the same as the commodification of sex itself, because then it's about the sex, not selling some other product with sex. The core problem with sexual objectification, the theory goes, is that the talents and skills of women that don't have anything to do with physical beauty are undervalued or not valued at all. So what, right? The problem here is that rigid gendered beauty paradigms get in the way of personal choice. They don't just tell us to seek out beauty. They also define beauty itself. The range of things that people find attractive is far wider than what's seen in the media. And this is why we call what the media depicts as beautiful, the beauty myth. In recent years, there's been an increase in sexual objectification of men in film and television as well, and this isn't the kind of equality we're looking for. There's an increasing disconnect between the qualities the media tells us we should value in men and the skills which are actually useful to society. Muscles don't matter nearly as much in this day and age, when the vast majority of problems aren't solved by hitting something hard with a big stick. Again. It's not that conventionally attractive men are a problem. The problem is the narrowing scope of what's considered attractive in men. When we apply these concepts to video games, we get an extra layer of complexity because video games are the art of humanizing pixels. In real terms, everything on a screen in a video game is an object, and the creative challenge is to make a player forget that. However, there are times when game developers want to maintain the inhuman quality of a video game character to stop the impression that you're killing a human being while still keeping the dramatic visual gore effects that communicate to us that we've successfully hit a target. Or barrels. This is my Jumpman from Donkey Kong impression. I think the hammer's gonna break. Low quality prop. That's why there are so many zombie games, alien games, and robot enemies in games. The game series Mass Effect played with this concept by making an artificial life form called the Geth the main enemies of the first game, then repackaging them as a highly philosophical companion character in the second and third installments. In real life warfare, it's very common to objectify enemies into nothing more than targets. Many video games explore this theme in positive and profound ways. But when objectification isn't this easy to spot, how do we recognize it? For over 200 years, philosophy, rooted in the Lutheran guilt of Immanuel Kant, said that any sexualization outside of monogamous marriage was objectifying. Specifically, Kant referred to this as a sexualized person becoming an object of appetite. This is admittedly not a particularly helpful starting point. Simone de Beauvoir put a finer point on it with her othering concept we looked at in previous videos, describing a hyper-awareness of being watched that women experience. De Beauvoir, a follower of Karl Marx's alienation theory, believed that women define themselves to an unhealthy degree as objects of male lust. And this is all still extremely broad, subjective theory that deals with real-world class constructs more than depictions in media. The results on I know it when I see it approach to objectification, which lacks clearly defined parameters. Again, not a particularly helpful starting point. This all changed in 1995 when an academic named Martha Nussbaum identified seven features of treating a person as an object. I'm going to take you through these features because it gives us tangible ways to separate sexy media from sexually objectifying media. And now you understand why I'm wearing an improbably tight dress in this video. 
The first indicator of objectification is instrumentality. The treatment of a person is a tool for the objectifier's purposes. This is tricky in video games because an entire game is a tool for the player's purposes. Video game immersion strives to minimize the player's awareness that everything they're interacting with isn't real, but there's always an element of a gamer's mind that knows nothing you're interacting with is real. That's why people don't necessarily behave in a game the way they do in the real world, and that's okay. There's a definite challenge in giving characters a function, but also giving them enough character to raise them above mere tools. Take the creepy shopkeeper guy in Resident Evil 4. Got something that might interest you. <laughs> his in-game function is to sell you loot, but he has enough character with his distinct voice and oh, oddly yeah. perverse trench coat reveals that you see him as more than a human vending machine. The prostitutes in Grand Theft Auto games, on the other hand, don't have similar character. They're mostly health stations that possibly stroke a player's ego and sometimes provide a few laughs. They don't have names, there are only a handful of different voice actresses doing the voices, and the whole act of using them feels way more like a transaction than a romantic encounter. Again, I'm not going to make a moral judgment on this. It is what it is. Walking the streets is generally not the ideal way for a prostitute to ply her trade because it's inherently unsafe in the real world. Get in, baby. The second documented indicator of objectification is denial of autonomy. The treatment of a person is lacking in autonomy and self-determination. Again, this indicator makes complete sense in the real world in live action media, but it's tricky in games. We're acutely aware that characters in games are controlled by code and are sometimes even controlled directly by the player. That being said, within the narrative of a game, this can still be a useful measurement tool. If a character has no autonomy within the narrative, for example, the way Kratos was manipulated by the gods and god of war, there's a likelihood the character is objectified. Yes, Kratos is objectified in numerous ways in God of War, including sexually objectified. This is an example of a deliberate design choice that provides character motivation. The motivation for Kratos' bloodbath is not just revenge. It's because the only way to be free of the gods is to be free of the gods. So Kratos gets a murderin'. Denial of autonomy is extremely significant regarding a character's ability to say no to sex. There's a huge amount of interpretive subjectivity on this point regarding video game narratives. In a given scene, a player can believe that a woman is offered up to the hero as a reward, denied the ability to refuse him by the game's code. Or the player can believe that she consents to physical intimacy because she thinks he's a great guy. Personally, I tend to err on the side of the great guy assumption. Denial of autonomy usually refers to the phenomenon of someone being unable to help themselves somehow. See? Most ads for Axe Body Spray. Seriously guys, Axe Body Spray smells like a cheap bordello housed in a locker room. You have been warned. Number three on the objectification checklist is inertness. The treatment of a person is lacking in agency and perhaps also inactivity. This happens all the time in games, when characters get hit with spells that freeze them, and punches that stun them, and so on. This isn't what we're worried about here. What we're talking about is images like this, where a woman's tied to a bed to sell... shoes? Something? It's a more serious issue in games when a woman is helpless and needs a man to save her, that dreaded damsel in distress trope. This describes early Princess Peach appearances, though I swear she's the most aggressive driver in Mario Kart, so I can't completely write her off on this count. The Mario characters have been used in so many different ways, they're like video game repertory theater. Even the damsel in distress trope isn't inherently bad. The overuse of any trope is lazy writing. There are plots out there other than save the cheerleader, save the world. Really. Point number four on our objectification checklist is fungibility. No, this isn't a reference to the Toad characters. Fungibility is the treatment of a person as interchangeable with other objects, and it shows up in advertising all the time. It also gets used in survival horror games because it's inherently creepy. Survival horror understands this. Some ads don't. The bad stuff that used to happen in games but is far less common now was the draping of women over trophies to the point that they're part of the trophy. That kind of hurt. Or worse, 
women serving in place of a trophy. But this wasn't unique to video games. It happened in all media in the 1980s. Number five on the list is violability. The treatment of a person is lacking in boundary integrity. Oh boy, here we go. For some unknowable reason, TV and film censors see violence as less mentally damaging to young minds than sex, even though sex can begin lives and violence can end them. But because of this cultural norm, a lot of sex gets filtered through the lens of violence, so we see a lot of sexualized violence against women in media, and against Daniel Craig in that torture scene in Casino Royale. Two points here. One, reminder, it's important that we distinguish depictions of sexy people from depictions of sexually objectified people. Point two, we need to recognize that sometimes sexual objectification can be used appropriately and painfully in art. Fiction often deals with situations that are challenges or traumas for the protagonist, so sometimes sexual objectification is used as a storytelling tool. The question we ask then is if the villain is objectifying the character within the story, like Jabba the Hutt and Princess Leia, or are camera angles, stagings, things like that, going above and beyond the story. The sixth indication of objectification is ownership. The treatment of a person is something that's owned by another. Basically, a person who can be bought or sold. And yes, we're back to the Grand Theft Auto hookers. Although, one could argue that you're buying the services of those women, not the women themselves. This goes down a complicated rabbit hole in a few counts. The first is the divisions within feminist analysis regarding the BDSM lifestyle. I'm going to err on the side of inclusion there and say that consensual BDSM isn't the sort of objectification we're concerned with here, precisely because it's consensual. Another issue is that some gamers, not naming any names, might be aroused by things intended to be creepy. That's not the fault of the game. What a game developer intends and what an individual gamer interprets aren't necessarily the same thing. For example, the mission in Watch Dogs where Aiden Pierce infiltrates a human trafficking ring. He's surrounded by beautiful, half-naked, and mostly naked women. But they're modern-day slaves. Should watchdogs be criticized for depicting a horrible modern-day reality because the crime of human trafficking objectifies the traffic people? I don't think that's fair. The seventh and final of Nussbaum's indicators is denial of subjectivity. The treatment of a person as something whose experiences and feelings need not be taken into account. This is usually a symptom of bad writing in video games because, again, video games strive to make you forget that the digital people you're interacting with aren't real. This indicator of objectification has been more of a problem in the marketing of video games as opposed to content in the games themselves. Some legitimately terrible ads have demeaned men and women alike by treating women like sex objects and men who play video games as gigantic losers. So that's the original seven markers of objectification. Three more markers were added to the list by Ray Langton in 2009. And these indicators, although relevant, involve a much higher degree of subjectivity than Nussbaum's original seven characteristics. Though these markers are accepted parts of objectification theory, I'd caution you against determining that a person is objectified based on any single one of these markers on their own. They work best in combination with Nussbaum's original list. The first add-on criteria is reduction to body. The treatment of a person is identified with their body or body parts. The Silent Hill nurses fall into this category. The boob physics in Dead or Alive Volleyball could also be considered to fall into this category since it calls artificial attention to the character's breasts. Mouse pads that simulate boobs, action figures with squishy chests, all this stuff falls into this category. There are varying degrees of the reduction to body effect and pinpointing the line between sexualization and sexual objectification is a huge point of debate. There's an obvious difference between admiring a person's body and only caring about their body, and so there's little here that isn't covered by Nussbaum's other markers. The second additional criteria is reduction to appearance, the treatment of a person primarily in terms of how they look or how they appear to the senses. This is a big issue in Western media. Understatement of the decade. Too many female characters in all media have appearances that don't make a lot of sense for their role within a story. This doesn't mean we can't have beautiful characters. We just need to broaden the definition of beauty so, for instance, athletic characters aren't running in high heels. Why? Try running in high heels. Just once. Again, there are a lot of subjective gray areas here. The key focus is that a character is reduced by limitations of attractiveness, not simply that 
they're attractive. Narrative has a lot to do with this element of objectification. A classic example of this are the women of the Mortal Kombat games. Katana, Melina, Jade, Tanya, and Sindel are pretty objectified in Mortal Kombat 3 onward. However, there's a narrative backdrop to that depiction. Edenia was annexed by Shao Kahn's forces, and so the wardrobe of the Edenians indicates a period of literal patriarchal oppression. Mortal Kombat's Edenians do fail the He-Man and She-Ra test, as characters like Rain have ninja garb that covers a lot more than his female equivalents in-game. This tells us something about the Edenian culture in the wake of Shao Kahn's occupation. Sometimes, though, things do get a little too crazy in the Nether Realm. Delia's wardrobe covers more of her face than the rest of her, and sorry guys, I, I got nothing to explain that. There's also no real explanation for Sonya Blade's moderately stupid Mortal Kombat 9 outfit, seeing as she was special forces from Earthrealm, and we know actual special forces here don't dress that way. But to Netherrealm's credit, they gave her a significantly more career-appropriate outfit in Mortal Kombat 10. The last additional indication of objectification is silencing, and this is why so many people lost their freaking minds over Quiet in Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Quiet is an objectified character in some pretty obvious ways, but she was designed to play with the player's assumptions. The game presented her as a highly sexualized, objectified character, then introduced layers of humanizing elements as the game progressed. Reaction to this was mixed, with some players unable to accept the artistic decision to deliberately objectify a female character. A polarizing choice like this isn't an inherently wrong choice, it just means that the reaction, and the reaction of that reaction, will be predictably loud. <laughs> Objectification is a storytelling tool which even Martha Nussbaum herself said isn't always bad. The problem lies in the historic overuse of sexual objectification of women to sell products, and we can all agree that too much repetition of anything is lazy storytelling. That being said, objectification has its place in art if it's used with consciousness, deliberation, and care. Big picture, the impacts of excessive sexual objectification of women has it's believed, led to an unusual preoccupation with appearance in many women. There's absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to look nice, but too many women believe that looking good is the most important factor in a woman's success, as opposed to intelligence, competence, and ambition being equally, if not more important. Contrary to the popular narrative, however, this is not a uniquely serious issue in video games. When I worked in television, image was the most important thing. But in the video game community, I've been accepted and appreciated for my ideas and analysis, and there's very little fixation on whether my hair is perfect. It's usually not. So when I do choose to glam up, like today, it's self-expression instead of objectification, and gamers should be given credit for this acceptance of women like me as whole people instead of something that's just nice to look at. Why doesn't this happen? Because the world doesn't exactly treat gamers like whole people either. Gamers are often used as a tool for the propagandist purposes, and that, we've learned, is a marker of objectification. See what I did there? Thanks for watching.